Greek mythology is taught in public school systems around the world. You probably learned some Greek myth in grade school, or read parts of the Iliad and Odyssey in English class like I did. You're also probably aware of that aspect of Greek religious life which Marcus Terentius Vero referred to as civic theology. That is, the state religion which was concerned with society and its interaction with the divine. As I've stated in previous videos, the Greeks and Romans were more concerned with public practice and ritual than private beliefs. As long as the traditional sacrifices and rituals were done, all would be well. Which is why philosophers enjoyed so much freedom to question traditional views. In fact, that is actually the second aspect in Vero's three-part division of the study of the divine into civic, natural, and mythical theology. That is to say that an ancient Greek or Roman could practice their spirituality through three different paths, which were in no means mutually exclusive. First, through the participation in local or imperial cults and public religious rituals. Second, through philosophical speculation about nature and reality, such as the Platonists who saw all of reality as an emanation of the divine. And thirdly, through the divine madness which inspired the poets and oracles, based on the narratives told to explain the world, myths. We're going to use his categorization to structure our own three-part series on religion in the Greek world. And because we're special, we're going to go through it in reverse order and start with the mythical, or should I say mystical, aspects of ancient religion. Because like I said, you guys already know the basics if you made it through grade school, but I don't think any of your teachers ever taught you about mystery cults. So get your pencils out, class is back in session. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're beginning our exploration of religion in antiquity through a discussion of its most hidden practices, the Greco-Roman mysteries. As the name implies, the mystery cults of ancient Greece were shrouded in secrecy, and yet they were as important in the life of an ancient Greek as the Olympics and Greater Dionysia. Like the Olympics, a sacred truce would be declared for 55 days for travelers to come from every corner of the Greek world and participate. Anybody who was anybody in the Greco-Roman world was sure to have been initiated and experienced something like the greater mysteries at Eleusis at some point in their life. Statesmen, poets, philosophers, even Roman emperors would list among the initiates of these cults. But that doesn't mean it was an exclusive club that only a select few participated in. Women and even slaves were allowed to be initiated, since the only requirements was not to be a barbarian or a murderer. The mysteries at Eleusis were practiced for almost 2,000 years, making it one of the most enduring features of ancient religious life. The punishment for revealing the secrets of the mysteries was death, which makes me thankful I don't live in ancient Greece, since today we're going to try and piece together the evidence to figure out what exactly those Greeks were up to in their 10-day festival of music, dancing, and feasting and see if maybe a special drink called the Kikion had anything to do with the fantastic visions that could be encountered during the mysteries. But before we get into it, if you're interested in Greek philosophy, spirituality, or culture in general, make sure to subscribe. We have new videos coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. There were multiple mystery cults across the Greek and Roman world, centered on a diversity of gods that spanned not just the pantheon, but also included Egyptian and Persian gods such as Isis and Mithras. The three most influential of these were the Eleusinian, Orphic, and Dionysian mysteries, all centered around the mystery of life, death, and the transformation and cycle between the two. Orpheus is of course the legendary hero who traveled to the underworld to save his dead wife. Dionysus has been considered an example of the dying and rising god archetype, and has been associated with not just the transformation of grapes into wine, but also the transformation that comes from the religious ecstasy produced by drunken revelry. The Eleusinian mysteries celebrated the famous myth of Persephone and Demeter, which explained the seasons and crop cycles, with the initiation process mirroring the myth in three phases, which represented Persephone's descent into the underworld, Demeter's search for her daughter, and the eventual return of Persephone from the underworld. In general, mystery cults were characterized by an initiation process that included ritual purification, sacrifice, and fasting, before a symbolic reenactment of whichever myth the cult was centered around, leaving the initiate with an unforgettable and life-changing experience. Religious ecstasy was an important aspect of Greek spirituality. The worship of gods such as Dionysus always included lots of music, ecstatic dancing, singing, and of course drinking to produce an almost out-of-body experience. That's what ecstasis or ecstasy means, to be outside of oneself. And it was probably like the flow state of being in the zone, 
where you lose your self-consciousness and become completely absorbed in the experience. While we will never know the specifics of what the initiates of each cult actually experienced in their rituals, we have scattered glimpses such as this description of the mysteries of Isis found in the ancient Roman novel, The Golden Ass. The main character, Lucius, describes the height of the experience as follows. I came to the boundary of death, and having trodden on the threshold of Proserpina, I traveled through all the elements and returned. In the middle of the night, I saw the sun flashing with bright light. I came face to face with the gods below and the gods above, and paid reverence to them from close at hand. As the Greek world spread in the Hellenistic period, and foreign gods were incorporated and synchronized with Greek gods, new mystery cults arose, but they still seemed to be generally centered around gods that were associated with the underworld, like the mysteries of Isis we just discussed. While there are some unifying themes across the mystery cults, like similar ritual practices and a concern with death, rebirth, and the afterlife, we should keep in mind that these were not unified or homogenous practices. And with no central religious authority, we can be sure that the practices changed over time, as evidenced by the fact that new gods were incorporated in later periods. The mysteries like those at Eleusis have been seen as an inspiration for the soteriological beliefs of later Christianity, though the rise of Christianity would also lead to the end of the mysteries after they were finally shut down by the Christian emperor Theodosius I in 392 AD. So what are we even talking about when we say mystery religion? You definitely know what a mystery is, and you might have heard of a mystical experience or mysticism, but you probably don't know that it all goes back to these mystery cults. You see, the defining feature that tied these religious practices together was the practice of initiation and secrecy. In fact, the Greek root of mystery means to conceal. Initiates were called mystae. So while to be a mystic originally meant to be an initiate into the secret rites of the mysteries, it eventually came to mean anyone whose spiritual practice was characterized by the pursuit of mystical experiences. The practice of mysticism can be found in every of the major world religions, but while Christian mysticism flourished mainly in the solitude of monastic orders, Greek mysticism was a loud and lively affair, parts of which were done publicly. The lack of evidence resulting from the secrecy that surrounded these practices give a misleading picture that they were somehow on the edge of Greek religious life, but by the Hellenistic period they had become a major festival comparable to the greater Dionysia that included grand processions, feasting, and celebration. I think one reason they get ignored, other than our lack of information about them, is because while the rites were held annually, you may only participate in the mysteries a few times in your life. The mysteries were like a religious pilgrimage, or a rite of passage, in that they were life-defining events, the sort of thing that was so powerful a person could never be the same after. It seems that participants got a revelation into the nature of life and death gaining hope for a good future in the afterlife. Since we have many testimonials from famous thinkers like Plato who tell us that, I fancy that those men who established the mysteries were not unenlightened, but in reality had a hidden meaning when they said long ago that whoever goes uninitiated and unsanctified to the other world will lie in the mire, but he who arrives there initiated and purified will dwell with the gods. Cicero gives the mysteries high praise, saying that, for among the many excellent and indeed divine institutions which your Athens has brought forth and contributed to human life, none in my opinion is better than those mysteries, for by their means we have been brought out of our barbarous and savage mode of life and educated and refined to a state of civilization. And as the rites are called initiations, so in very truth we have learned from them the beginnings of life, and have gained the power not only to live happily, but also to die with a better hope. Eleusis was seen as a place where the spiritual and material world met. A sacred cave on the temple grounds was considered to be an entrance to the underworld and the very spot where Hades abducted Persephone. The mysteries themselves were split into two events, the lesser mysteries which were held in the beginning of spring, and the greater mysteries starting in the beginning of fall, bookending the planting season. Both the office of Hierophant and High Priestess were inherited, since the mysteries were conducted by two families of hereditary priests which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. I'll just put them up here on the screen for you. The lesser mysteries were traditionally said to have been started on behalf of legendary figures such as Heracles and the brothers Pollux and Castor, who asked Athens if they too could be initiated. They seemed to have functioned as a way of introducing the initiates to the symbols and concepts they would encounter during the full initiation, including the idea that the soul was in an impure state, trapped by the material body, with the goal of the greater mysteries being the purification of the soul, and the gaining of an understanding and hope for a life after death. Like the greater mysteries, they included a sacred truce, ritual purification and sacrifice, 
and dramatic representations of the Persephone Demeter myth. The greater mysteries would start after the priestesses of Eleusis brought a basket of sacred objects known as the Hera from the temple at Eleusis to the Acropolis in Athens. They traveled 12 miles down the sacred way, the only paved road in central Greece before the Roman period, visiting sacred shrines along the way. After this procession, the festivities would officially begin when on the first day, the initiates from across Greece gathered in the Agora in front of the painted portico. The Archon Basileus offered prayers and sacrifices and gave a warning. Come, whoever is clean of all pollution and whose soul has not consciousness of sin. Come, whosoever has lived a life of righteousness and justice. Come all who are pure of heart and hand and whose speech can be understood. Who has not clean hands, a pure soul, and an intelligible voice must not assist at the mysteries. A vow of silence was taken by the initiates, which some scholars interpret not just as a promise to not reveal the experiences of the rites, but also a vow to remain silent during the process of initiation. This may have served as a kind of speaking fast, intended to quiet the mind in preparation for the experience of the mysteries, since fasting was a central part of the rituals. It seems most days would be spent fasting, which was usually broken at night with simple meals. The day would conclude by parading the sacred objects through the Agora to the Temple of Demeter and Persephone, called the Eleusinion. On the second day, the initiates were called to the seashore south of Athens, where they would take a sacrificial pig to perform ritual cleaning and purification, immersing themselves in the ocean. On the third day, the pigs would be sacrificed perhaps as a scapegoat which served as a proxy to symbolically purify the initiates. The fourth day was a mini-festival just for the god of healing, Asclepius, which appears to have been a general celebration of doctors and the healing arts, and may have had a focus on the healing of ailments. They would spend the night feasting and perhaps dreaming, since there was a common belief that illness stemmed from a person not being aligned to their divine destiny, and so it was believed that a god could visit you in a healing dream and show you your purpose. The attendants of the gods, called Therapeutae, would offer spiritual treatment and healing, sometimes by interpreting these dreams, giving us the origin of the word therapy. The fifth day is when the initiates finally set out for Eleusis in a grand procession, accompanied by singing, ecstatic dancing, and the swinging of branches known as Bakoi. Before entering Eleusis, they would cross the Bridge of Jess, where locals would gather to insult the initiates with obscene jokes and gestures in an imitation of Iambi making Demeter laugh with dirty jokes. Once they had arrived at Eleusis, there was an all-night vigil, perhaps representing Demeter's search for her daughter. Finally, the initiates entered the great hall of the temple, called the Telesterion, where the so-called mystical nights would finally commence. As you can probably guess, we know almost nothing about what would occur during these final days and nights, but it seems there was a reenactment of the Persephone Demeter myth, which included three elements. The telling of the myth, known as the things done, a display of sacred objects called the things shown, and finally a commentary on those objects called the things said. They spent two nights and one day in the dark temple, with the drama reaching a pinnacle with a seemingly transcendent experience including a powerful vision of light and beauty. Plutarch gives us the following description of the experience in the Telestrion. At first there is a wandering and wearisome roaming and fearful traveling through darkness with no end to be found. Then just before the consummation there is every sort of terror shuddering and trembling and perspiring and being alarmed. But after this, a marvelous light appears and open places and meadows await, with voices and dances and the solemnities of sacred utterances and holy visions. In that place, one walks about at will, now perfect and initiated and free, and wearing a crown, one celebrates religious rites and joins with pure and pious people. Such a person looks over the uninitiated and unpurified crowd of people living here who are packed together and trample each other in deep mud and murk, but who hold on to their evil things on account of their fear of death, because they do not believe in the good things that are in the world. The final night in the temple was spent feasting, dancing, and all around celebrating. The experience was so powerful, the initiates would come out of it with a new view on the soul and death. A later Greek philosopher, Themistios, who lived in the 4th century AD, compared the experience of death to the experience at Eleusis, saying that, the soul at death has the same experience as those who are being initiated into great mysteries. At first one wanders and wearily hurries to and fro, and journeys with suspicion through the dark as one uninitiated. Then come all the terrors before the final initiation, shuddering, trembling, sweating, amazement. Then one is struck with a marvelous light. One is received into pure regions and meadows, 
with voices and dances and the majesty of holy sounds and shapes. Among these, he who has fulfilled initiation wanders free, and released and bearing his crown, joins in the divine communion and consorts with pure and holy men. The ninth and final day was when they finally returned home, ending the long week with an early morning bull sacrifice and honoring the dead with the pouring of libations. Apparently the celebrations were only suspended once in the whole history of their practice. When news had reached Athens of the destruction of Thebes by Alexander the Great, the festival was called off. So that's the mysteries. But if you know your stuff, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, he left out perhaps the most important part. One of the most provoking and controversial theories on what exactly produced the mystical experience at Eleusis is centered on an important step in the rituals, the drinking of the Kikion. Though the term goes back to Homeric times and can probably be applied to a few different drinks throughout time, in general, if you're talking about Kikion, you're talking about the special drink that was given to the initiates once they entered the Telesterion. It was mainly made of water and barley meal. Sometimes it included wine and even grated cheese. But some scholars have suggested there may have been a particularly special ingredient in the Kikion at Eleusis, ergot. Ergot is a fungal parasite of cereal crops, including rye, wheat, and of course, barley. Different varieties contain different alkaloid profiles that produce a range of effects on circulation and neurotransmission, some not so fun. Over 30 alkaloids have been isolated from ergot, including ergotamine and ergonovine. And when these ergot alkaloids are hydrolyzed, we get their precursor, lysergic acid, so-called because it was the product of the lysis of ergot alkaloids. You've probably heard of its more famous synthetic derivative, lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. The discovery of chemicals that could produce such a profound effect on mood and consciousness led to the discovery of neurotransmitters and the importance that chemicals like serotonin had in producing our day-to-day -day experience. Though serotonin had been discovered by the 1930s, all we knew about it was that it was a vasoconstrictor. Surprisingly, though, surely not coincidentally, the undesirable side effects from long-term consumption of ergot, known as ergotism, stem from these vasoconstrictive properties. First comes nausea and vomiting, then sometimes seizure and spasms. And finally, prolonged vasoconstriction could even result in gangrene. The vasoconstrictive effects cause a burning pain, leading ergotism to be known as St. Anthony's Fire, an unfortunately common medieval disease. But you'd have to eat a lot of moldy bread to get to those points. Ergotism has been pointed to as a potential cause for many instances of mass psychosis throughout history, including the Salem Witch Trials, the Dancing Plague of 1518, and the Great Fear of 1789. And there was a wide folk awareness of the psychotropic effects of ergot. For instance, in German folklore, it was said that when the corn waved in the wind, a demon known as the Corn Mother was passing through the field. The ergot, which was called the Rye Wolves, were her children. The famous Swiss chemist who first synthesized LSD from ergot, Albert Hoffman, along with the famous ethnomycologist R. Gordon Wasson, would go on to propose that the power of the Eleusinian mysteries came from ergot in the barley. And though they lacked solid evidence at first beyond comparing accounts of the experience, they seem to be vindicated when fragments of ergot were found recently in a temple dedicated to the Eleusinian goddesses. And so, while there are many interesting theories as to what exactly went on at Eleusis, with many tiny pieces of information we can try to piece together, it seems that we will never be able to solve the fundamental mysteries at the heart of Eleusis. Whatever went on, it seems that Albert Hoffman was certainly right about one thing. The priests at Eleusis were the masters of set and setting using music, dance, fasting, ritual, and likely intoxicating substances to produce a transcendent experience. After all, cultures around the world have always used these practices to join people together in an experience of the divine. Anyways, that's all for today. Don't forget to like the video if you learned something new. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.